today our breakout session is titled Faster, Cheaper, Better um, IP Technology. Perf uh, perfect audio and readiness for tomorrow. I should have read this. Chris. You know, you think you know you think I'd know better having worked in the radio. Well, business. imagine how much I'm going to stumble. Yeah, I got so, 40 so, minutes to talk. So, uh, anyhow, it's presented by Kirk Harnack, and uh, he's from the Telos Alliance, and uh, he is a senior solutions consultant. Wow, we ain't got any junior ones. Okay, so so uh, for Telos and brings more than 35 years of hand-on experience in broadcast engineering and education to his position. His expertise in putting technology to work in broadcast facilities has driven notable expansion in IP, audio, VOIP for broadcast and other technology adoption uh, by audio content creators. Um, he maintains an, uh, an active hands-on role in broadcast engineering, member of the board of directors for SBE, and program chair of chapter 103 in Nashville. Uh, he also does the internet video netcast um, this week in Radio Tech or Twert. And uh, it's a one hour netcast, and um, you can see it from anywhere in the world about radio. Uh, well, actually, not radio engineering, just engineering in general, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Telos <coughs> Alliance is a longtime sponsor here and uh, this conference, and uh, including our lunch today, and thank you very much for that. And uh, frequent presenter, and uh, we're delighted to have him back again. Welcome, Kirk. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Oh, man. I get real nervous before these things start, so. Uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm about 40 years out of date, because 40 years ago it would have been quite normal for your speaker to stand up here and, and, and light a cigarette. And uh, you know it's weird to go in and buy cigarettes when you're when you're not a not a smoker. And where I come from in Tennessee, uh, there's not a whole lot of tobacco farming going on anymore. They've switched to wacky backy farming. <laughs> More money. More money in it, apparently. But what was good 40 years ago may not be very good today. Um, I was standing in our booth, our Telos booth, and, and uh, a couple people were talking ab about obsolescence of modern equipment and how things seem to go obsolete pretty quickly. As a manufacturer, buying, I mean, selecting parts that are going to be around a while is actually pretty difficult. If you ever had a, a Telos One hybrid, the, the little Telos One hybrid, Internally, that thing was actually redesigned three times because parts going non obtainium And, and uh, uh, Frank Foti was standing next to me, and I forget who was asking, but they, they said, um, Frank, can you build me a console that in 25 years from now I can still maintain? And Frank said, I think you're talking about the Gates Yard. <laughs> <laughs> if you want us to build the Gates Yard, then sure. So, we're going to talk about better, faster, cheaper, and happier using today's lower cost technology for perfect audio now and tomorrow. And in, in this presentation, oh, do you want me on mic? Do I need to be on mic? Does that help you out a lot? Are you recording audio? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk around a bit. Yeah, questions. questions should be on the mic too? Okay. All right. <clears throat> I'll try to talk so long we won't have any time for questions. And, and speaking of, what time are we out of here? 310? Okay. All right. Well, I need, I need, to, need to get moving then. You know, when you have, and I'm sorry the font ran off the top, when you have disruptive technologies, what other people tend to say about that, like your competitors or maybe even uh, other engineers or your own colleagues who don't quite believe that what you want to do is workable, the first thing they say is it won't work. And the next thing they say is, well, it may work, but you know, that's not really something we do in broadcast. And then the, the last thing that our competitors say is, oh, we, we do that too. And this happened certainly with uh, audio over IP. Uh, that, that really happened. And it happened with Frank and his audio processing uh, as well. Let me tell you, let's just spend a few seconds on a little personal story. Disruptive challenges can bring about some big changes, like the whole TV repack. You know, that, that is challenging for a lot of people, equipment manufacturers and antenna manufacturers and tower crews and, and telling people they have to rescan their dial and trying to make fun, fun videos about that on TV so you'll keep watching us. 
every one of these, now discount me, I'm not a celebrity, although we took that picture in a TV studio, but look at all these celebrities here. Each one of these celebrities or famous people or politicians overcame an interesting challenge, and it was the same challenge. Every person on that screen, from the time they were a child until some point in their adult life, stuttered profoundly. And there's even a movie about uh, uh, King, is that, was that King George, that guy? Was that movie The King's Speech? I saw that, I, I cried through the whole thing because that, <clears throat> that was my life, except that I was able to overcome that. About the same time girls quit having cooties, I decided this won't work. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna ha I'm gonna have to learn how to talk. And you know what I discovered? The, the thing that clicked it for me, the, the, the technology that made me go, oh, was the fact that, and someday I'll, I'll maybe write a book with this title, the microphone doesn't judge you. People judge. But a microphone, you can stutter into a microphone and it doesn't care. So the microphone doesn't judge. And so when you have disruptive challenges, oftentimes you come up with disruptive solutions to those things. Now let me take you back to 1992. Uh, this is in Orléans, France, at a little radio network there called Vibration. Um, they, they had this great slogan. I, I love CHR stations. They got great slogans. This was Vibration Plus Fort which means in French, turn it up. Or, you know, vibration, turn it up. Plus full. Um, but I, I was going through some old pictures of me, and, and this picture here made me stop and think. Every device in that rack, in the two racks behind me, every single device is purpose-built. It does one thing. And it may do it really well. It may do it for a long time. But it does exactly one thing. And so does basically everything here, does exactly one thing. Now, I guess you, since the Sage Endec and the Orban processor are, well, the Orban's more DSP based. It's not a general purpose processing device, although it may have a, 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 a general purpose processor to load the DSPs. I'm not sure it's internals. But everything on here is, is built to do one thing. A, a Sage um, probably doesn't have the right architecture to be an audio processor. And it doesn't have the mechanicals to be a, a reel-to-reel -reel or, or a CD player. But the turntable there will never be anything but a turntable. It certainly did that very well for a long time. And, of course, where I'm going with this is you know, we, we built studios with all this dedicated gear. And, you know, for that studio to work, it took that person to be right there to m manipulate everything that's in that studio in order to make a radio show. Um, uh, even today, we still kind of build studios that same way. So even though there's a lot of gear in there that's PC-based or CPU-based, um, you still for that studio to work like it's designed to, you've got to set human bodies at all those positions. Well, when we talk about virtualization, there's a lot of things we can mean by virtualization. Um, one of the things would be just simply replacing cart machines with a general-purpose computing device, a, a PC. So did anybody else get to use, was this a, a DCS from Computer Concepts? Is that what this is? I think it is. And it, it, who knows, it might have been running some of those uh, CD jukeboxes to play audio with. Uh, but that was an early example of virtualization. It took the place of some cart machines and a person to load a cart in and unload a cart and, play at, and trip them at just the right time. Did away with that. More recent virtualization would be putting a audio console controls on a touchscreen. Uh, on a PC or on, on, on a tablet computer. Um, uh, one example of that, this upper left-hand corner, some years ago, um, <clears throat> I think a lot, of, a lot of you probably know a guy in the industry, you love him or you hate him, Gary Klein. Gary worked for Cumulus, was under a huge amount of pressure from the Dickies for years and years. And um, Gary came to me in Nashville one time and he, and he said, um, uh, Kirk, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I need for you guys to tell us to loan me 30 audio consoles for a week. Gary, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, I doubt we have 30 in stock, and we're not going to take 30 new consoles and make them into 30 used consoles. How about the Dickies just write us a check? He said, and that's not going to happen either. Okay, let's see, figure out what we can do. Well, we figured out that some of the gear that Telos already made, these Axia consoles and the mixing engines, built in have these uh, uh, virtual v, v mixers, five input mixers. And uh, nowadays, an Axia console's got 16 of these things hidden under the hood. And you can use them for whatever you want to use them for. 
But there's a protocol to control them, and we gave Gary the protocol, and their Cumulus' company, BSI, wrote some software for an iPad to run this little console. So we could run uh, mics up and down and push a button. we get five other faders to run headphone volumes up and down. Bottom line is we gave him 30 audio consoles. We let him buy 30 audio consoles at a far cheaper price than buying 30 audio consoles because we virtualized that. Well, these days there's a company in France that makes a, uh, a pro... A, uh, software called IP Tablet. You can put all kinds of things on it. Call screening can go on there. Uh, your, your webcam or you know, your view of the front door. Uh, just all kinds of cool controls can go on, on these tablets. So that, that's another form of virtualization. Every one of you has a virtualized device, uh, or a, a virtualization device in your pocket right now, and it's a phone. Now, I don't know if this figure is correct. A $200 iPhone, was there ever a $200 iPhone? I don't, I'm not sure, but I, I cribbed this picture from somewhere. But seriously, though, um, you know, everything on this Radio Shack ad can be done in, in a manner of speaking, some very well, some better than the product itself, others not quite as good. But the point is you can do all $5,000 worth of stuff on a $1,000 phone or a $400 phone or whatever, whatever you pay for yours. Well, let me, uh, and by the way, in this presentation, I don't really have a product to sell. I don't, have, I don't have a technology to sell. We're going to talk about a few technologies uh, that TELUS has been involved with. Uh, but I, I want to just open your eyes and open your brain to some possibilities of what we could do uh, in the future, in the very near future. And some of it we can actually do right now. So we're going to play a little video here. This should be the Scott Shannon video. And let's see if I can make this work. One thing is still the same year after year. It's about the individual behind the microphone being able to communicate with the people who are listening online, on their phone, in their car, on their radio. So we asked the question of a major European broadcaster of what would the talent in the studio really like the future of their technology, the future of their studios to look like. And the answer that came back was not what we or the broadcaster was expecting, but there were two clear things they wanted. One was cushions and the other was daylight. Hi, my name is Dan McQuillan from Broadcast Bionics and today we want to talk about the Bionic Studio. That's the future of radio production, fitting it to reach and retain an audience of distracted listeners and also helping you to measure and monetize all of those different platforms that radio now needs to reach. So a Bionic Studio means a studio which is listening and watching and reacting to what's happened. So rather than the technology merely being passive, it's, it's part of the production. I mean, if you think about it, you wouldn't hire a producer and then sit them down the hall and have them not listen to the program. Uh, they couldn't be much help, but that's basically how the technology has been. It's been passively inert in the studio. But now through uh, intelligent and fast transcription, the studio can react. It can understand what you're saying and automatically detect topics or segment your program. Using face detection, we can recognize who's speaking on cameras to help to generate the metadata that lets us drive more intelligent programming. So a Bionic Studio looks and works in terms of your operation exactly the same as a passive one, but the tools that you're using are able to react in context. You play a particular song, we can react to that song by pulling more information and control into the studio. It's about capturing the very best moments of radio, those intimate moments when the voice breaks and you know a caller's going to cry, when you, when you have something that just has that driveway moment, when you can't exit the vehicle because there's that compelling moment. And now I want to make that content shareable and searchable so it reaches a whole new generation of listeners uh, and is discovered in just fantastic and exciting new ways. My experience in a control room is pretty simple. The less I think about the technology, the better off I am and the better my show is and the better my performance is. To, to lead in our world, it's all about innovation. It's what's that new, next big idea? Anytime we get to take our content and spread it that helps us create word of mouth, or as it is now, online digital postings and social, that gives us the greatest promotional tool ever. And that's something we're all trying to embrace. Essentially, radio is a document. It's just a spoken document. But we've considered it all along to be audio. So by transcribing it, that audio becomes searchable and discoverable, not just to audiences, but to us within the radio station. So we can search for, yeah, someone said banana yesterday. That's fine. They said it at 17 minutes past 10 in the morning and exactly this many milliseconds. So it's not just accurate transcription. It's time accurate. So now imagine you can edit your entire show just by clicking on the words or the script within the show. That's actually all you're really doing. 
doing using a waveform editor. It's just that you are having to map between squiggly lines and what was really essentially a spoken performance or the words that happened. So it makes radio searchable, which is fantastic. Uh, it makes it fit for sort of closed captioning, which is the way that now people often read Facebook uh, audio before they actually click and hear it. And importantly, it makes it time accurate so that you can do your job just by clicking on the words that you said, whether that's searching for them or using that as an in and out cue to edit. I think we can create an even more intimate environment for radio. We don't want to get rid of all the technology, but we need to smarten it to a point where it becomes less of a distraction. And I think the whole cushions and daylight idea was, can we actually make this a more comfortable and natural an environment? Not just for the talent and presenters, because we're kind of used to this stuff, but I think when we're interviewing people and we're inviting guests into our space, if we were sitting surrounded by cushions and daylight, I think what we would get out of our guests and the way we appear to our audiences would be transformed. There's nothing wrong with the way we make radio. We want to help you to make it smarter and better and fit for all the devices that we now have to hit. Uh, so thanks for giving us your time. Uh, we're trying to start what we call the creative conspiracy. That's uh, engineers working with talent in the studio to take technology and help really to improve content uh, and have it do exciting things. So if you want to join the conspiracy, you can see what we're up to. Uh, our website is bionic.radio, uh, or hopefully we'll be in touch to find out how we might be to help you to build a bionic studio for the future. Thanks for listening. So let's look at some technologies, and then we'll look at how uh, virtualization can use technologies to make our jobs easier and, and, and content uh, more interesting. Uh, of course, there's voice over IP. We're all pretty familiar with that. Most of us have already switched to it. A few have not. Audio over IP, well, Telos has been doing that since 1999. Um, and now we have some real standards like AES 67 and SMPTE 2110 30. What about intercom over IP? That's a technology that TELUS has been developing for a few years now. And MPX over IP. Frank Foti talked about that this morning as well. So voice over IP, yeah, I think you get that using like the TELUS VX system. Uh, can tie into your existing uh, IP PBX. You can literally uh, lower costs incredibly. Um, in fact, tell you what, let's, uh, right, two, four, tell you what, let's, let's skip this let's video. I'm going to skip this video because it just talks about how much you can save. And you can save a, a ton. Uh, audio over IP. Steve Church uh, pointed out some years ago, um, he said, someday I think everything's going to have, every piece of equipment's going to have a, a, an Ethernet jack on it. Um, and we're going to be able to control it one way or another. Um, I mean, if, if we already have what uh, refrigerators that tell you, what, you know, what's missing, uh, how cold it is, how much life is left on your strawberries. Um, uh, we have microphones now that do have AES-67 coming out of them. Uh, one's made by Neumann, another experimental one by uh, Audio-Technica. Uh, we have transmitters. Uh, I, I own a couple of Nautel transmitters that have a live wire input uh, on them. So uh, at, at my radio stations, almost everything is, is uh, live wire, audio over IP, and they're a joy to work on, easy to work on remotely. Well, this audio over IP, of course, has really taken off, uh, as you may expect. There's almost 10,000 uh, Axia consoles around the world. And then of the other brands, there's, I'm sure, thousands more. So this is really, really everywhere. Uh, audio over IP, because it runs over a computer network, can really make uh, studio construction pretty easy. This is a studio in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in a facility where they had built one studio. So they had a, a rack room, and they had all the infrastructure to support the one studio, and they needed to add a second studio. So they added this one where they do uh, Nashville Nights from, and there's literally one Cat6 cable between the rack room and the studio. And everything they need can pass over that Cat6 cable. Uh, all the audio control uh, telephones for on, on, on the air phones, everything. Now, I think they ran a few more cables, but it doesn't look like the typical, you know, huge tray of wiring that we're used to. So there's that kind of flexibility. Another kind of audio over IP, um, remember the, uh, the Olympics from Sochi, Russia, a few years ago, the Winter Olympics? Um, a lot of broadcasters went there and figured out they had problems with ISDN. Uh, luckily, a lot of them brought some backup, but, um, and they used codecs, you know, like the TeleZip one or Comrex codex or tie lines. Um, well, Swedish radio didn't bring a codec with them. They just brought a, an Axia X node, which is not coded audio. It is, it's digital. It's two and a half megabits per second for a stereo stream. And they had access to a fiber network that goes across Europe uh, for media use. So pretty much guaranteed quality of service. And so instead of bringing um, uh, several codecs at a cost of two to $4,000 each, 
to the Sochi Russia Olympics, they brought one Axia X node that sent uh, four stereo or eight mono channels back to Radio Sweden over that, that network. So that worked out very well, and it was cheap, too. Intercom over IP is uh, something new that we're, um, uh, we're doing. These are uh, being sold now. Let me go over here and see if I can get an example of one. I should have gotten these out beforehand. I think I brought a couple of belt packs here with me. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, good. All right, if you'll figure out how to put the belt pack clip back on the back, it's pretty, it's not too hard. That'd be great, because I got only one hand available. Let's see about the other one. Yeah, here's the other one. So this is a, a, a belt pack that you might find, um, you know, for a TV station, floor director, camera person. Um, but it's audio over IP, and it's powered over Ethernet. So you just plug that into the, to the network, and it gets power. Um, it can be on DHCP. It really doesn't matter what its IP address is. And not only does that have AES67 audio you know, receiving in and out, that also has a, a CP unit that can be a renderer. That can render a party line, for example. If you're familiar with TV intercom or theater intercom, you might have a party line where... It, one person talks, everybody else could hear that person. And there's other forms of intercom uh, communication uh, available. That even can run a codec to send coded Opus audio to another facility somewhere and connect two different uh, facilities together for, for intercom. Now, there's the larger panels, too. And, of course, they have more CPU power to do more rendering and, and more, more codec space. The big advantage for a system like this is that there is no central matrix and if you ever put an intercom system in, you know that can be the real expensive part. It's also the part where you run out of expansion space. So if you've got a big matrix system, like represented here, you might have this matrix here. You run out of space, you've got to buy another matrix. Well, that's probably another hundred to $200,000 for another matrix box when you fill it up with cards. This particular example, this pretty big system, um, uh, and it's had three matrixes. Everything circled in green here with an IP-based system that's matrix-free, everything circled in green goes away. You don't need it anymore because it's all that's done by the belt packs and the, uh, and the, the rack mount panels. So just an, just an example of the uh, architecture that can, you, you can do because you're IP. As I mentioned, you can also uh, have site-to-site uh, uh, -site communications built in. So you can, uh, you know, across a WAN or even across the public Internet, you can run uh, the codecs and, and connect these sites together. Um, another technology here uh, is MOIP, <laughs> Multiplex over IP. Frank talked about uh, this a little bit earlier, but I want to show you an example here. Um, you can take any FM audio processor, come out of it with the FM analog MPX signal. Normally would go into your analog STL, you know, your, your uh, MPX STL. Uh, but you can run that into a box like this one that does a little uh, coding called micro MPX. It will take that analog in, and out of that will come 320 kilobits per second of IP. Now, 320 kilobits per second um, is the equivalent of four VoIP phone calls at the same time. That's pretty, you can handle that over a DSL circuit. You can handle that over lots of different circuits. So you can send that IP stream to your transmitter site, decode it with a similar box, just with a jumper in a different place, come out of that as the same analog MPX, left plus right, stereo pilot, left minus right, RDS, and run that in your transmitter. Now, uh, TELUS has been shipping these for a uh, couple of months now. Uh, I tried out a prototype on my own radio stations in Mississippi, and um, it, it was amazing. I was, I was really floored by how well that it, it worked, and I had a prototype. They're, they're better now. Other examples, though, are there are processors on the market that you can get um, not only from, from Omnia, but there's a, a couple other ones, that you can uh, buy a license from Micro MPX. So they spit out n natively uh, 320 kilobits per second, go across a link, and at the transmitter site, just have this one box and go into your transmitter. Uh, sir, you could go across an IP radio link, uh, less than 400 kilobits per second across that link, so you got lots of room for other stuff, and uh, you can have your processor at the studio that way and send everything out that way. Now, it, it doesn't send, um, it doesn't send uh, um, HD radio. This is, this is only you know, the, the stereo FM baseband up to and including the RDS signal. 
And then if you have a bunch of transmitters at one site, you, you know, at under two megabits per second, you could send five um, out to a single transmitter site over you know, whatever your connection is. But that's, you know, that's a small amount of data these days. And so you can get really good quality. Uh, people ask, well, wait a minute, isn't that just coded audio? You know, it's micro MPX. How are you getting, because other companies sell boxes that convert MPX or baseband, right, into IP and send that along and take it out the other end. But those typically are anywhere from two, or typically two and a half to three megabits per second. And easily, if you crank up the quality to something pretty reasonable, you're at five and six megabits per second. Uh, maybe that's more than you want to afford. I've got several transmitter sites in Mississippi where we have uh, a wireless ISP available to feed uh, internet to the site. And six megabits is all we can get out of that wireless ISP. So the coded micro MPX will be ideal as a backup path or even as a main path to get my FM signals out to those sites. Well, I just want to introduce those technologies or, or get them on the table here to point out that um, virtualization is made possible by these IP technologies. So there's a lot of things that we can do by having things in the IP world. Part of that is because there's, the IP world is so big and so flexible, right? I mean, they're probably from your phone. You're engineers. You probably have a myriad of things that you can do right now from your phone. And if you don't, shame on you. You should get busy and you know, hook things up so you can do stuff on your phone. Um, hey, uh, actually, earlier today, I was browsed into remotely into this same computer as I'm showing here. Somebody wanted to know, uh, Kirk, we, we love our Axia system, but we kind of need to switch a couple things, but we don't want to pay $5,000 for Pathfinder. We just need to switch this and switch that. And, and we realize everything Pathfinder can do for us, but man, that's a big, big bite to, to bite off if all we want to do is a couple things. So I pointed out a free program from this, literally a kid in Australia, called um, Livewire, um, Livewire something delegation switcher. Um, and it's, it's free and it works fine. And I use it on, on this computer as well. Uh, but my point here is that this computer, this one, this is a Dell server, but it's, it's just running one OS. Um, it's encoding seven streams with audio processing. Half of these are with Omnia 9 processing. Uh, it's doing um, uh, silent sensing with a free program called Pura. So it'll send out text messages uh, or e emails uh, and then text messages if we have a station that goes off the air. And uh, you know, so you can do a lot of stuff. Uh, here's an example of uh, uh, a PC being an FM audio processor. This is the Omnia SST program. It's a full multiband FM audio processor. And it also can have uh, micro MPX built into that. And so you can take that, and in fact, that's in my experiment, I was using this program uh, to send audio to that micro MPX hardware decoder to feed it to my transmitter. Worked great. Now, if you've been to a lot of stations, or maybe your station looks like this, more and more of your functions have gone to PCs, right? And pretty soon you get to collect a lot of PCs. <laughs> you've collected quite a few of them. Uh, and you go into most any radio station these days, or, or even TV stations, and you'll find, you know, Dell's laying on their side on a little shelf, and you'll find these Dell server platforms. And what you also find is that you have a whole lot of power supplies and a whole lot of hard drives and a whole lot of fans. And as engineers, we know that those three things, uh, death taxes and the death of these three things, they will not live longer than the PC, probably. They're, they're going to die. And so that's kind of sad because, uh, you know, a lot of stations are set up. Uh, I've got a number of computers, and... You know, if any one of them die, something's going off the air. We won't have weather forecasts, or we won't have school closings, or we won't have um, voice tracking. You know, we won't have the John Tess show. We won't have um, uh, Bart Dickley, or Dick Bartley's Rock, Roll, and Remember. Um, we, um, I'm, and I've been messing that up so long, I wonder now if I do it on purpose or on accident. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of sad when we do that. Uh, I've built a lot of radio stations, but very few of them with any actual server technology because we never could afford a three, four, five thousand dollar computer. We could always afford a hand-me-down or a off-lease Dell that actually came from Walmart.com. Not sure how good an idea that was. But if we can if we can virtualize the PCs, we're already what virtualizing functionality from hardware into a, a general purpose device, a desktop PC. But what if we can then take those desktop PCs and put a bunch of them into a much better piece of hardware, a computing device. 
Uh, and plenty of you here, I know, you're familiar, especially if you're, if you're young, like some young guys up in front here. You, you know all about this. You take physical hardware, and the good news is you get to spend some actual money on this physical hardware and have dual uh, power supplies. One of them can fail, and you're still on the air. Uh, you have dual processors, lots of RAM, uh, rated hard drives, 17 fans in one, in one box. Sure, it's noisy when it starts up, but you know what? If two of those fans die, you're still on the air. You, you'll have time to schedule a replacement of, of the fans. And on top of that, physical hardware runs the hypervisor. Um, and the hypervisor provides a platform for other uh, virtual machines to run. Windows, Linux, I, old graphic I found, Solaris. Anybody run Solaris? Um, but you get the idea. Uh, you can run all, all that. And that makes much better use of that hardware. Now that hardware is chugging along at 70, 80, 90 percent CPU utilization, and you're getting your money's worth out of a piece of hardware. And by the way, because it's a server, there are technologies to back the whole thing up or even have a hot standby. So if one server dies, bam, you can be on another server pretty quickly. And these are technologies that a lot of us radio guys don't know all about, but we know some IT guys who might know about that. And so that's why we're, we seems like we're handing a lot of keys over to the IT guys. If they're on board, I think this works well. So here's an example. This is um, uh, a bunch of these are on the same server at my radio stations in Greenville, Mississippi. And even though not all of these are on the same server, they could be, including uh, this asterisk phone system. Uh, just everything that's on the screen. Here's an ingest system that ingests, like the John Test Show and other voice tracking. Uh, it corrects file name errors and, and preps uh, everything for, uh, uh, for going on the air. I guess a lot of our shows come in as MP3s or the voice tracks come in as MP3s. Our Rivendell wasn't, doesn't want to play MP3s, has to play WAV files. So a program like this does all that conversion too. We used to pay an old drunk dr drug addict 30 grand a year to do all that. Now we just, that program does it. Bless his heart. I mean, I like I like the guy, but you know, if he didn't show up, the John Tess show wouldn't be on overnight, right? Um, here's an example. Now, my boss told me not to show this picture, but I'll give you some caveats. Telos doesn't sell this. This is an experimental only. Okay. Um, uh, everybody know our buddy Alex Hartman in Minnesota. So Alex built this up. There are 30 radio stations in this in this cluster here uh, in 18 rack units. Uh, there's uh, playout systems, there's all the source material, all the songs, um, uh, fake commercials, these are all non-commercial. Uh, it's in a university environment. Uh, the, the, and, and, and they have audio consoles from Axia, they can connect to any one of those 30 radio stations, or any number of them. So they have actual studios out in the, in the plant, and they can tell, hey, console, uh, I want to operate you know, KNYQ today. And so it connects to KNYQ's engine and operates KNYQ and, and the automation system. So it's getting to where we can do an awful lot in a small amount of space by virtualizing. Let's see. Let's take a look at a bigger example of doing that. And this will be almost all we have time for by the time it's uh, time to go. So let's take a look at this. Vile for me is about a clever and value for money way of guaranteeing BBC local radio in the future. For us as a team, Vila will mean an even closer relationship with our audience. Vila is about giving BBC local radio the equipment that it needs to make the best programmes possible. Six twenty-one, BBC Three Counties Radio. Back to the ACs now. Elton John, I'm still standing. The BBC Local Radio Service is an extensive one. Forty-one broadcast centres across England, broadcasting around the clock. Some of our local radio stations now have technology that is more than twenty-five years old, and frankly, it's becoming unreliable. And that's a real worry for me because our local radio stations have a special responsibility to broadcast in times of emergency. What Vilor will give us is a way of refreshing all of those technologies station by station at once without the individual cost mounting up by doing repeated refreshments site by site. And it will also deliver a much more energy efficient solution. So what is Vilor? It's virtual local radio and I'm standing in front of it. This is one of the two engine rooms that's going to power local radio into the future. This is in Birmingham, the other one's in London. 
In the stations, we're going to remove several hundred bays of ancient kit, and instead in the studios, you'll have software and control surfaces that will remotely control the equipment behind me. Along the way, we've done a pilot in Radio Northampton. We used it on air for about 165 hours with no major on-air incidents, so we know it works. So what we have here is a three column design. You've got phone lines coming in and out, so this is all the telephony for the studio areas. Our audience here in Northamptonshire, like audiences everywhere, are increasingly finding new and different ways to communicate with us and to share things with us. Social media, Twitter, Facebook, Skype, as well as all of the other phone calls, emails, everything that we've traditionally used. And what this means is we'll have all of those things in one place for our producers and presenters to use. The great thing about Vylor is that it's designed by local radio people for local radio people. So right from the outset, local radio presenters, local radio engineers have been involved in the planning, the design, the concept of Vylor. And all through the testing phase, we've involved presenters, they've given their opinions, they've changed things. So by the end, we've got something that really works, that for the first time ever is designed by English regions for local radio. Northamptonshire Travel, BBC Radio Northampton. I don't really know what helibores are. Vilor is a, a complex and challenging project to deliver. I'm really proud of the team here in Birmingham, particularly for the level of innovation that they've managed to deliver successfully, but also for the way they have run complex set of relationships, first of all with the thousand plus staff who all have views on what they might need from their local radio station in the future, but also for the way they've successfully delivered uh, quite a complex web of relationships both inside the BBC and with the outside suppliers. The Vylor project is a, is a unique project and, and something that I'd never heard of being achieved anywhere else in the world. The BBC have taken an approach where they've been working with uh, suppliers, best in breed suppliers. They've collaborated with those suppliers to take existing product, to develop that product, to make it work for the Vylor project. And when we piloted it here at BBC Radio Northampton, our audience, unprompted, got in contact with us to tell us they'd noticed an improvement in the quality of our sound. Hello, welcome to BBC Essex. This is Louise Briley and it's... The it's a guaranteed future for BBC Local Radio. It's a future which is more efficient in terms of the way we spend the BBC's money and resources. And it's about delivering a new technology that I think will set a standard for the rest of the world. For us as a team, what Vila will mean is we have exactly what we need to have an even closer relationship with our audience. Vila is about making sure that BBC Local Radio has the best kit, the best equipment to make the best programmes possible. So I, I got to visit uh, BBC Local Radio in Kent, and they had two studios um, right there. Um, one of the studios was connected to their data centre in Birmingham, and the other one to the data center in London. And they could switch between them, no problem. Basically, the only thing in the studio is a, a mixing surface, but the mixing engine isn't there. It's in London. And their microphones go to London. And the headphones, oh, actually, there's a headphone mix that's done locally. That's the only thing that's done actually locally. But their, their phone system, their codecs, their automation playout, it's all in London. The workflow for these people is exactly the same as it ever was. But instead of 12 racks of kit, as they call it, equipment or gear, as we would call it, uh, instead of 12 racks of that in each station, they're down to two racks at each station. Now, they can go on locally. They do have just enough mixing, that, and they, can, they have some backup stuff they can put on locally. But they haven't, they haven't done that. Um, uh, and in London, they have about five racks of gear that has all the mix engines for all these stations and all the VX phone systems and a bunch of codecs, too. So in the future, uh, or as, actually right now, Telos, for example, our Pathfinder Core Pro product. You can buy this as an appliance, or you can buy it as a virtual machine, either way. And it's exactly the same either way, except one is a piece of hardware, which a lot of us are comfortable with hardware. Some of us would be more comfortable, though, with a VM. Interesting thing about hardware is if the hardware dies, you got to buy a new one. We're not going to give you another one. The VM, if the hardware it's running on dies, it's up to you. You supply another piece of hardware that's going to run the same Linux virtual machine that it runs in. And there's probably lots of options for you to do that. And there probably will be to on down the road. Um, and it'll still run. So you, may, you can make that investment once or, or on a subscription basis. I'm going to skip past a couple. 
it, they haven't done it yet, but think about like uh, uh, DASDEC, your EAS. This runs on a PC. It's in, it's in their box. But you could virtualize your EAS functionalities, right? You could. Um, right now, you can go to radio.co, and in a couple hours from now, you can have a radio station online. Now, it's not feeding a transmitter, but gee, what if they were running, what if you could run Omnia SST with micro MPX? and at 400 kilobits per second, or 320, the, the data rate, uh, get that out and go to your transmitter site with it. And what if you, your EAS was up here? What if you could do that? Uh, what if you actually had live interaction where you could talk over songs uh, and send that up there? Of course, you could run, remember that ingest program I told you about that we replaced the, uh, the adult uh, uh, drug addict um, to ingest stuff? You could run that program up in the cloud and ingest all this stuff automatically. That's all certainly possible. So we're thinking about, I mean, TELUS is working on our part of it. We can't provide all the parts of this. But what if everything you needed, you could put either in a private data center or in public cloud uh, to handle it. You can have people work from home. Um, you could have, you know, we do that now with voice tracking, but you could do more live stuff. And as the lady from BBC said, we have the tools to have a closer relationship with our public. You don't, every, everybody doesn't have to show up at the same studio. There's benefits to that, but your studio can also have a lot less gear in it and get exactly the same job done. So you can um, simplify local studios. Talent and sales can work from anywhere, even from home if they need to. You have convenient syndicated program distributions, no sun outages if you're doing satellite, and certainly people are talking to us about either dropping to uh, dropping or backing up their satellite with uh, terrestrial. And there's a huge project I did in uh, Australia where they send lots of programs all across Australia, five time zones, uh, both satellite and terrestrially, uh, using some, some Telos gear. And um, in fact, uh, uh, gee, all their all their satellite service went out and they didn't even know it because the, the, the terrestrial still worked. Um, and even smaller stations can leverage large scale data center efficiencies. So are we out of time? Probably are, yeah, it's quarter after. If, if it's a hot burning question, ask it. Otherwise, thank you for your attention. Uh, nothing to sell, but think about how you might put this kind of stuff to use in, in the future, what your future might look like. Thank you.